I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you're watching PBS Books. Thank you for joining us. PBS Books is pleased to partner with the Zeckelman Holocaust Center to host a conversation in connection with the U.S. and the Holocaust, a new documentary film by Ken Burns, Lynn Novick, and Sarah Botstein. It is a new documentary series that examines America's response to one of the greatest humanitarian crises of the 20th century through riveting firsthand testimony of witnesses and survivors who as children endured persecution, violence, and flight as their family tried to escape Hitler. This series delves deeply into the tragic human consequence of public indifference, bureaucratic red tape, and restrictive quota laws in America. Let's take a moment to watch the trailer. We tell ourselves stories as a nation. One of the stories we tell ourselves is that we're a land of immigrants. But in moments of crisis, it becomes very hard for us to live up to those stories. The Holocaust was beyond belief. People just disappeared. The primary goal was to get to the United States. But the golden door was not wide open. We are challenged as Americans to think about what we would have done, what we could have done, what we should have done. In our better moments, we are very good people. But that's not all there is to this story. and welcome. I'm Eli Newman. I am a reporter with WDET, Detroit's NPR station. And I have the, on the honor of moderating this event where we'll offer a Michigan perspective on the upcoming PBS documentary series, The US and the Holocaust. As a Jew born and raised in Metro Detroit, the Holocaust undoubtedly shaped, helped shape my identity, even though I was born many years after it occurred. And the scars of that global tragedy, I think, are felt deeply within this community. And many of its members have gathered here for this conversation at the Zuckelman Holocaust Center, the only Holocaust museum in Michigan. This three-part series from filmmakers Ken Burns, Lynn Novick, and Sarah Botstein offers a new look at how the United States reacted to the rise of Nazi Germany and its persecution of European Jewry and the role that the American Jewish community played during this turbulent time. With me to discuss, I'm joined by an esteemed panel of experts in this field. To my left, we have Dr. Jeffrey Weidlinger, Professor of History and Judaic Studies at the University of Michigan, Reverend Stancy Adams, Chair of the Interfaith Leadership Council of Metro Metropolitan Detroit, Arthur Horwitz, publisher emeritus and former executive editor of the Detroit Jewish News, and Dr. Catherine Kinkany, executive director of the Jewish Historical Society of Michigan. Now, Dr. Weidlinger, I, I, I want to start with you. Um, in preparation for this conversation, I was reading over some transcripts from the Nuremberg trials, and there was a particular account uh, from Oswald Paul, who is a key figure in implementing the final solution. And for those who might be unaware, the Nuremberg trials were the, the trials that occurred after that held some of the surviving Nazi uh, leaders to hold them to account for some of these war crimes. And in his testimony, he talked about his early career and how he studied American publications and articles that were featured in the Dearborn Independent, which was a weekly newspaper that was published by Henry Ford, the automaker, in the 1920s. And specifically, he referenced the importance of a series of articles called The International Jew. So Dr. Weidlinger, what was in those essays, and what kind of influence did they have around the world? Yeah, so thanks for the question, and thanks for having me here. It's a, a pleasure to be here um, again. Uh, the International Jew was a series of articles that were published in the Dearborn Independent. As many of you probably know, the Dearborn Independent 
was a newspaper funded by Henry Ford that had an anti-Semitic agenda. And it published a series of articles about the influence of Jews in the United States. It's actually a fascinating document because when you read it, the things that the Jews are blamed for are a lot of things that people would be proud of right now. They're blamed for bringing liberalism to the United States, for bringing free speech, for bringing Hollywood, for bringing department stores, um, all of these, but they're twisted in the Dearborn Independent and the International Jew to be ploys, to be secretly ways of obtaining power in the United States. So if we think of theater, it says that the Jews brought in popular theater. So instead of having to study theater the way it used to be, instead of having to read Shakespeare, read the play in advance, you could now go to the theater and anybody could enjoy it. It democratizes theater. And for that, the Jews are blamed as being, you know, as corrupting theater. They're blamed for corrupting clothing by introducing ready-to-wear clothing. So instead of going to a skilled tailor to get clothing, you can now just go to a store and get clothing. It democratizes the sale of clothing. And so the Jews are blamed for all of this, and it's purported to be a ploy to take over the world. The idea of the international Jew was borrowed from the protocols of the elders of Zion. Uh, which was a document published in Russia in 1903 that did a, had a similar goal, which was to take ideas like liberalism, like democracy, uh, and blame it on the Jews. To say these are ideas that are generally going to be popular. If you're an ordinary person in Russia in 1903, you're going to want democracy. You're going to want to have a voice in the public. You're going to want free speech. But this is a way that the elites can say these ideas of democracy and free speech, they're not real, they're just ploys of the Jews to take over the world. So Henry Ford took those ideas of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, he reformatted them to make more sense in America, and he published it in the Dearborn Independent as the International Jew. And they had a big influence around the world, including uh, in Germany. Yeah, so specifically, uh, I, reading some of uh, his reaction to, to uh, to Ford, Paul said, uh, to quote him directly, he says, this attitude of this great practical American impressed me particularly at the time and strengthened my belief that the racial and Jewish question was not mere theory. There's uh, another um, uh, leader, uh, one of the, the, the heads of the Hitler Youth, who was also uh, testified during the Nuremberg trial, and he said, he, uh, on, on the international Jew, he says, I read it and became anti-Semitic. In those days, this book made me such a deep impression on my friends and myself because we saw in Henry Ford, the representative of success, also the exponent of a progressive social policy. In the poverty-stricken and wretched Germany of the time, youth looked toward America. And apart from the great benefactor, Herbert Hoover, it was Henry Ford who to us represented America. Now, others have tied the influence of the international Jew to Hitler's Mein Kampf. And before becoming the German chancellor, Hitler told the Detroit News that he regards Henry Ford as his inspiration. So how complicit was Ford in the rise of Nazi Germany? I mean, Ford was a major figure, as we all know, and he was complicit as well in the rise of communism, or at least in, the, in, in communism uh, in the Soviet Union, also looked towards Ford because they looked towards the way that he turned uh, factory workers or human beings into factory workers. So there was this whole cult of Ford in the Soviet Union as well. So it's interesting that he could influence both sides. On one side, he could influence the communist state, the Soviet Union. And on the other, he could influence the fascist state of Nazi Germany, as well as having a big influence, of course, here in the United States. So he's a tremendously influential figure. And these writings of the international Jew takes the ideas. I, I presume most of you have heard of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. But I'll bet very few of you have read them, because they're really difficult to read. They don't actually make all that much sense, particularly in our context, to read them now from what they're saying in 1903. But Henry Ford took those ideas, or at least whoever wrote The International Jew, he sponsored it, but I don't think he actually sat down and, write and wrote it. But whoever wrote The International Jew took those ideas and distilled them in a way that really made sense to American audiences as well as to European audiences. So I think it's, it's tremendously influential. That's not to say that Hitler, wouldn't have, uh, that Hitler wouldn't have come to power without the international Jew or without Henry Ford. Um, it was one factor among many. Uh, there was a lot of other things going on in Europe that, didn't, uh, that weren't influenced by the United States. But it certainly is not a proud moment in our local history, in Michigan history. Sure. You know, now, Dr. Kangany, in terms of these other prominent 
anti-Semitic figures that came out of Metro Detroit. There was also Father Charles Coughlin. So who was he, and what kind of influence did he have? The radio priest. Oh, into the, the radio priest uh, of, of uh, our local basilica, the uh, Shrine of the Little Flower. He had an enormous audience of millions tuning in every week to his radio broadcasts called Social Justice. Um, and he was taking the ideas perpetuated by Ford and by others, packaging them in, in using the technology of the day, which was radio, um, and, and disseminating them to his huge audience. So, so he is another extremely important figure in disseminating these ideas about anti-Semitism. And of course, you know, th those two aren't alone. They're others. Um, but but Coughlin continued, continued um, speaking to his audience until the 60s, which is something we don't think about. We sort of think he's in the 30s and he's gone, but he persists until the 60s, which is incredible. So his, um, his influence and, and, and on our community you know, continues. There are certainly um, lots of Jewish people who grew up um, afraid of Coughlin, still not driving by the Shrine of the Little Flower. So this is an ongoing, um, this, this is an ongoing fear that continues today. Now, did that fear ever kind of result in any sort of, of action by the local Jewish community here in Metro Detroit? Were there boycotts? Were, were, there, were there protests? What happened there? Yeah, certainly, and, and particularly for Ford. I mean, what, what, ultimately, um, what, what ultimately derails um, the Dearborn Independent is, is because of the uh, boycotts of Ford vehicles that actually started, uh, started to get some traction. And so Ford was counseled um, that he needed to um, dispense with his anti-Semitism so that his sales could improve. So, there, so there's a really uh, amazing way that you know that um, the power of the purse actually does work in some instances, and and lawsuits help too. But um, but certainly boycotts are in there. Sure. No, Mr. Horowitz. Now, as somebody who has a long-standing history with the local Jewish press here, how did papers like the Detroit Jewish News and its forebear, the Detroit Jewish Chronicle, talk about? these anti-Semitic figures and this kind of rhetoric that was happening in its backyard? Well, the, uh, the Detroit Jewish Chronicle, which uh, actually was founded in, I believe, 1914, uh, was front and center uh, going through the uh, digital archive uh, of the uh, Detroit Jewish News and Jewish Chronicle, which, by the way, is available uh, open source. Uh, you see uh, them taking on Henry Ford you see these, more than critiques, I mean, front page to the extent that they did front pages the way they did then, as opposed to like the New York Daily News big headline kind of front pages. Um, they had it front and center. And they had it in front and center in the 20s, in the 30s, all the way through the 30s. Uh, the notion that people didn't know uh, what was going on or starting to go on to Jews in Europe. Uh, these papers, the Chronicle and the Jewish News, which was founded in 1942 by Philip Slomovitz, who had been the editor of the Chronicle, uh, it was front and center. Uh, what was going on, they took on Henry Ford, and in fact, in the 1930s, they challenged the leadership of the Jewish community because they felt it was being too timid, it wasn't being uh, vociferous enough, it wasn't taking stands, and it constantly was not just putting in front of our community, but it was poking. Phil Slomovitz, both for the Chronicle and the Jewish News, was poking Jewish community leadership. He was poking Stephen Wise uh, to kind of get out and get on that soapbox and do more rather than just be quiet behind the scenes, because in the 30s, given what was going on here in Detroit and also, of course, what we saw in the documentary in the United States, Jewish community was a kind of a Shah still kind of community, wanted to be great American citizens. That became the priority. And Dr. King, and you feel free to, to chime in on this, but in terms of that difference of opinion that manifested within the Metro Detroit uh, Jewish community about how to deal with some of these issues and in the, in the rising anti-Semitism, both locally and abroad. W how did that manifest? Like, what, what, were, what were some of the uh, you know, opinions that were, that were happening at the time? 
So it's a it's a range of opinions, um, and that's true. You know, certainly through the 30s, even even up until almost the mid 40s, that's true. That there's a a, a range of opinion, you know, from from um, indifference all the way to to vociferous um, concern and agitating in the U.S. government. And Phil, Phil Islamovitz is a great example of that. When he hears about the pogroms in Germany in 1933. He approaches the U.S. Secretary of State with the reports that he's getting um, from the uh, Jewish Telegraphic Agency and other media outlets, and and says, you know, look at these reports. The United States needs to do something, and and he was dismissed. Those um, reports were were um, dismissed as exaggerated. Um, so he's he's the guy who is who is urging the community and and the country um, to do something. But but as um, Arthur, as you said, you know, so many. Um, Members of the Jewish community were concerned about speaking out, were, um, were reacting as Americans first. Um, and so, so it, it really isn't until the idea of Israel gets um, yoked with the Holocaust that, that there seem to be ways to react as a Jewish people. There's, there becomes a clear Jewish identity. But amazingly, the war effort is, is incredibly supported by the Jewish community. Um, it, it, this time, um, Jews were 4% of the US population, but they represented 8% of the US military forces. But in Detroit, it's even more incredible. So smaller than 4% of the population, but 11% of Detroiters serving in the military. So, um, so that, that's incredible. Um, and the other thing that the Jewish community did really well during the war was raise money for it. Um, the Jewish Federation of Detroit was the first in the United States to throw in with its, its annual campaign with the community war chest. It's the first one in the country that does it. So instead of um, setting aside money for its own purposes, raising money, giving it to the community to support the war effort. And those fundraisers each year were incredibly successful. Hmm. Now, Mr. Horwitz, these conversations and these, these ways to figure out how to deal with some of these issues is something that I think you experienced firsthand in, in your household. You're the, your mother was a Holocaust survivor. Can you tell us a little bit more about her experience and how those conversations, ha what happened in your household in, in terms of some of those conversations? Sure. So, so in many ways, the, uh, the conversation that we're having now uh, as a child of a survivor could be distilled down to conversations. I grew up in New Haven, Connecticut, by the way. Uh, conversations at our kitchen table. My mother could not and would not understand how we as American Jews could have not known what was going on, could have not acted what, on what was going on, could not have been more forceful on what was going on. My father, who was born and raised in New Haven, Connecticut, was saying essentially, yes, dear. You had Father Coughlin on the radio. You had the Bund in Madison Square Garden, as you saw. They were marching you know, on the New Haven Green. Um, you, you had the home of eugenics was kind of Yale University in New Haven, and Yale's president, a man named William Rowland, name ring a bell, was the son of University of Michigan's president and grew up in Ann Arbor. So you had all of this literally outside of their doors. And the other thing, too, is hindsight's 2020, right? So what we would do today, or what even as a kid in the 1960s, early 1960s, what, what we might be doing as a community, as a more confident Jewish community, as a community that had Israel as, as a focal point of pride, you can't take that and overlay it onto what was going on in the 1930s when, in my father's point of view, you know, it was tough out there. We were trying to be good Americans. And my mother is saying, but that doesn't reconcile with what I experienced in that was kind of taking a lot of this conversation and putting it right there at the kitchen table. Hmm. Now, Reverend Adams, I think th this film really draws this explicit line that the kinds of racist and anti-Semitic laws that were seen in Nazi Germany were directly inspired by those seen in America, particularly uh, the Jim Crow South. And I wonder, um, given that there, there's 
tends to be this attitude, I think, in northern states that that's not their history. And I wonder, given everything that, we, that we've discussed so far, does that bear true? Where, where does Michigan fit in in, in, towards of, in terms of some of these policies? Ah, uh, it is probably not understood by everyone here, but in my community, uh, Michigan is probably one of the most racist states in the North. Um, we think that because it's in the North, of course, they were not a part of that whole Southern thought processes. However, if you remember what was said about Henry Ford, many of Southerners migrated to the North and they brought their ideology with them. And now when we look at our government and what is going on there, much of it is racist oriented rather than just Democrats and Republicans. It, uh, it's horrible. The things that we see, you see the killings, uh, the, the killings in the South uh, mimic some of the killings that are going on or did go on here in the North. They just were not talked about. We talk about Ohio very often as being a very racist state, but Michigan is even worse. There are even areas today that African Americans will not be caught in uh, driving through. You know, we talk about the sundown uh, law that's there. Well, there are certain parts of Michigan that black folk are not going to just travel in one on one or just two people traveling through the community because of the um, racist attitude that exists. Now, Dr. Weidlinger, I, I wonder if you can speak on that connection that these racist policies in America had and the influence that it had on, on Nazi Germany. I mean, like, how were, were, the, were these things that were explicitly remarked by, by leaders of the Nazi party? Yeah, so they were aware of Jim Crow laws. I don't know the extent to which they studied them and replicated and, and had the Nuremberg laws, the racial laws in, the, in Germany replicate them. They certainly knew about the Nuremberg laws. Oh, sorry, they certainly knew about the Jim Crow laws. What I think is uh, more interesting is the, um, is the way that affected American responses. Because Americans were very aware of what was, at least many Americans were aware of what was going on in the South. And I was just today, actually, I was showing the class I teach on the Holocaust, a letter written to a student newspaper, and I think it was University of Missouri, but arguing against intervention or against, uh, against joining the war, against the United States joining the war, saying, why should we go to fight for justice? this for another group of oppressed people when we have our own record right here in the United States. We should be fighting for the oppressed people in the United States rather than going abroad to fight for the Jews. Um, and that's you know, an opinion that's expressed in, a, in an American newspaper and I think was widely thought of through the United States. Um, so I think in that way it kind of limited the American response among liberal-minded people uh, who felt that racism was wrong, but felt that we should start battling racism at home rather than sending our troops to Europe to fight it. Uh, I want to say actually another word also about what we knew about what was known at the time um, while I'm talking about these letters. It's interesting because we talk, I actually tell my Holocaust class at the very beginning, the very first day of classes, I usually talk about some atrocity that's happening elsewhere in the world. Uh, just last week I did it, my very first lecture on the Holocaust was about the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And I talk about what's going on there, and the students are all a little bit confused. Am I in the right class? Why is he talking about the war in Ukraine? I thought this was the Holocaust. And then I say to them, you know, I'm just telling you this because I want you to know that there are atrocities happening around the world right now. And what are you doing about it? And you're going to ask yourself every day for the rest of the semester, how did nobody do anything? And I just want you to know that there's stuff going on right now. It may not be the Holocaust. But there are still atrocities happening around the world right now, and what are you doing? And it's not necessarily a call to action on their part. I want them to recognize that sometimes there isn't all that much you can do. Sometimes you, know, you have information, but you don't know how to act on it. And this was the case with a lot of what Americans knew about the Holocaust. It was in the newspapers. Uh, word of atrocities appeared in the newspapers, but they didn't quite understand it or appreciate it. And I think the most salient evidence of that is, you know, the first mention of Auschwitz in the New York Times comes in July 1944. 
And it's an article that says inspections and investigation has shown that 1.7 million people have been killed in Auschwitz, have been killed in a concentration camp uh, called Auschwitz. First time it appears in the New York Times. It's a little article on page three. And that is, in many ways, the story of the 20th century, uh, is what happened in Auschwitz. And that the New York Times buried it on page three shows that they had the information, but they just didn't understand it. They couldn't process it uh, in the same way that you know, we may have information about other atrocities happening around the world, but it's difficult to process it. It's difficult to fully appreciate what's happening. Uh, so having the information doesn't mean that you know. Now, the film really makes a point of uh, these immigration quotas. And in terms of what we can do with this information about uh, what's going on overseas and how we can act on it domestically, there did, like you were saying, there, there was this knowledge about these atrocities, about what was going on, and there was the, uh, an explicit policy in terms of the number of people that, this, that the United States would let in every year. And yet, we, we, de we do hear from polling that there was tremendous reluctance to increase those quotas. Dr. Kingany, I'm wondering, how, how do we make sense of some of those attitudes, given what we knew about the atrocities that were happening in, in Europe at the time? Well, I think another, another piece to add to the puzzle as we're thinking about um, threats at home, which, which really were taking the focus for, um, for Americans, including American Jews. Um, we talked about Ford, we talked about Coughlin. Um, there's also the Black Legion, which is a breakaway movement from the Ku Klux Klan was more militant, more violent, um, and they had a scheme, and uh, its Michigan commander had a scheme in 1939 to detonate a bomb in every single synagogue across the United States on Yom Kippur. So, you know, what, what Ford was writing in his newspaper, it was ugly. There weren't always threats and, and um, plans for violence attached to those articles, but the Michigan um, chapter of the Black Legion shows that actually there were very serious things um, that threatening and, and happening at home. So I think, I think that plays into you know, this, this quota question in a way that um, you know, we, we, have, um, we have concerns at home and those are what we need to be dealing with and not, not taking on problems in, in far off places in the world. Um, Mr. Horowitz, was that part of that conversation between your parents where we're talking about what could have been done, what should have been done. Was was that explicitly mentioned, or were, and were there other kind of policy decisions that that your mother was advocating for? Right. Well, I, I mean, the focus at the dinner table, at the kitchen table, was what did you do? Why couldn't you have done more? And my father basically was saying, here's the context for what was happening, for what was going on. Um, I, I think in, 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 in relation to, uh, to, to, to some of what we've heard as it relates to Henry Ford, as it relates to, to Father Coughlin, uh, as it relates to Jim Crow laws and influence, uh, I mentioned in passing uh, eugenics and Charles Lindbergh. Charles Lindbergh's papers, all of his papers are at Yale University. That's where they've collected him. He was a hero for the you know, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, uh, many who were in the State Department at the time. So you had these quotas, and at the same time, you had not just what we've talked about, but you have this underlying kind of superiority that's baked in at many of the, at the time, the country's leading institutions of higher education that were such that why would you want people like that, and it wasn't just Jews, it was Italians, it was others as well. Why would you want people like that coming? So again, it, it doesn't exactly fit with the kind of table talk, if you will, that we had, but it's all there. There are these layers of complexity that I, I think in the 1930s, especially leading up to the, you know, what became the, the Holocaust, of what did America do, what could it have done, what was the context, and I think there are historians, some who are right here on our, our, our BIMA, if you will, on our stage, who are trying to figure that out as their life's work, <laughs> not black and white. Yeah, Reverend Adams, I, I wonder, in terms of how we can contextualize people like Charles Lindbergh and Henry Ford and Father Coughlin, I mean, 
there is a deep history of, of racism in, in the United States. Do you see, d does that help to inform why some of these attitudes were so, so much at the forefront of the American psyche at the time? Is that how, you, how you're able to understand that? Um, you know, I, as I listened to the conversation, one of the thoughts that I had was that the information that people had was controlled by the leadership and their agendas. You know, uh, an article buried on page three that was the number one topic for the country at the time, it's because those people that are in power want to control the narrative of what happens here in our country. Uh, and, and if it doesn't impact them or if it does impact them, they want to control that. So now that we look back and we look at Lindbergh and some of the others that are writing, I can tell you that many people do not know this information. If they're in the classes of either of these two professors, then they learn. If they're in some other university, then they learn. But most of the people have not gone to a university, and most of it is not taught in a school. So I cannot say that it's going to have an impact on changing the way things are, because they don't know. And we are guided by that knowledge that we're taught when we're young, and then we bring it to, uh, to fruition when we become adults, and it's either a positive or a negative. And so here we are today, talking about the Holocaust. That is still so very, very painful. And if we look at the children, your children, how many of them have really been impacted by the Holocaust beyond your conversation? And it's because that information is not disseminated properly. Now, Dr. Kingney, in terms of that thread, that you know, there is all of this history, maybe some of it doesn't get transmitted to the general populace. I mean, how do we see some of the effects of, of, of the Holocaust, maybe some of the lack of being able to rectify some of these very prominent figures in Metro Detroit? How do we see that kind of manifest in Metro Detroit after the Holocaust? So we're still dealing with Henry Ford, right? I mean, his, his hate speech in the Dearborn Independent is more popular and more, more easily accessible now than it was in the 20s, in the 1920s when, when it was published. Um, it's on, you know, parlor, you know, um, a, a, a whole bunch of, of social media platforms. It's also um, in influencing a number of um, white nationalist events, rallies, um, and, and so on. Um, it's been found at check, checkpoints at the US um, Capitol. So it's very much still in our imagination and in our present in 2022, unfortunately. Um, we need to get to the point where we're comfortable with both sides of the man. Doesn't have to be one or the other. He's, he's both brilliant and uh, an anti-Semite, and we just need to make peace with that. And that's true for Father Coughlin, too. Um, Andrew Lapin did a wonderful podcast um, on, uh, on Father Coughlin last year, which is on tablet. Um, it, it was spectacular, and hopefully, you know, bringing Coughlin back into the American imagination and sort of reinvestigating him, hopefully that will, will do some of that work. But it, but it very much is, is things like this, where, where we talk about the past, we talk about why we're still dealing with it in 2022, and what the, what the resonance is and the importance and the significance for us living through it now, um, that's important. We gotta keep doing stuff like this. Now, in terms of that uh, connection to a contemporary extremism, uh, the Anti-Defamation League released a report this year that anti-Semitic incidents have reached an all-time high, and 18% were connected to domestic extremists. And in Michigan, the ADL also noted that there was also a sharp rise in anti-black, anti-LGBTQ, anti-Asian, and anti-Muslim hate. So, and this is, I think, for everybody to kind of chime in on, but how, how do we make sense of this sharp rise in hate in America? I don't know that there is a, um, a, a one thing that we can say that we can change it. Uh, I agree that we need to start talking about it. But as I listened and watched the, the film, and the, um, and I can't remember his name, the second uh, gentleman that talked about the Statue of Liberty being the white lady standing in the midst of the, uh, uh, of the uh, 
lake and, and, and talking about how, you know, what do we stand for and this is who we want to come in here. You know, that's where we have to start. We have to start changing the message that is out there because that's one of the biggest lies that we're told, saying that bring us your, your hungry and, and those that are in pain because that has never been realized. And this gentleman actually told the truth of what white America thinks. And it's superior to everyone. And that's the sad part because I have um, family members that are, uh, that are white and uh, we talked about once the Native Americans being here in the United States before anyone else came in. And so they took the land from them. And his remark was, huh, they just came in on the Bering Straits and they don't have any more right to it than anyone else and feel superior to what he's saying and superior to most people that are anything other than white Anglo-Saxon Americans. So what do we do? We have to educate because children are a byproduct of what they are taught at a very early age. And unless we start to do a better job teaching our children, and it's not teaching them hatred, it is certainly teaching them what has happened and the ways that we can fight against that. You know, let them know that there have been some things. Be honest about your history, but let them know also that you said it'll never happen again. But that didn't mean that you were going to take up arms and shoot everyone that's against Jewish people or everyone that's against black folk. Now, Dr. Weidlinger, is there a, is there a, uh, how do I say this, a context in which you know, like I, I was just saying, that there is this steep increase of, of hate incidents. What kind of factors drive this kind of uh, behavior in a historical context? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think hatred exists and has existed for a long time. Anti-Semitism has existed for a long time. Uh, the question is leadership that instrumentalizes it and that uses it for poor purpose. And, you know, anti-Semitism and anti-Jewish sentiment in a variety of forms existed in Germany long before Hitler came to power in 1933. But Hitler was able to instrumentalize that, to mobilize it for political means, and to unite the nation, to use it as a means of uniting a nation against the Jews. So I think leadership really makes a big difference. Uh, in this context, and it's leadership not only at the top level, not only at the presidential level, but leadership at you know, all levels of government, leadership in churches, leadership in universities and schools and teachers, but all types of uh, leaders, that that's where individuals can make a difference, is in the form of leadership. If they're going to instrumentalize it, if they're going to use hatred and anti-Semitism in order to uh, you know, get their goals across, or if they're going to fight against it. And just on that you know, topic of people, of leadership, um, you know, we talked about Father Coughlin, we talked about uh, Henry Ford, which are Michigan's black uh, moments there. But I want to think of some of the positive moments uh, in Michigan. And one of those is, or one of the positive heroes, and one of those is Raoul Wallenberg, who many of you probably know is one of the very few heroes in the story of the Holocaust, uh, who's responsible for saving tens of thousands of Jews in Hungary and went to University of Michigan. He did an architecture degree at the University of Michigan. And it's at the University of Michigan that he most likely first met other Jews, first met other people who were not like him. He came from, uh, uh, he came from Sweden, which is not a particularly heterogeneous, uh, heterogeneous nation. So it's where he first met people um, who are not like him and where he you know, developed. He had no particular love of Jews, but just a recognition that they're human and that all humans deserve protection. He risked his life and, in fact, gave his life uh, defending tens of thousands and saving tens of thousands of Jews uh, from the trains to Auschwitz. So uh, also another more positive Michigan connection that we can hold on to and another example of good leadership. Hmm. Now, Dr. Kingany, I mean, are there other kind of bright spots that kind of came out of this really turbulent moment in Jewish history? Were there other Metro Detroit you know, uh, heroes, think, th people that really uh, maybe changed the, the tide of, 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 of history, whether it be the Holocaust or afterwards? 
I'm, I'm going to invite the other panelists to weigh in because I, I'm not sure. I mean, one, one that I would, um, one that I would champion again um, is Phil Slomovitz. I mean, he, he was a remarkable person for calling attention very early on um, to what was going on in Europe, and he was not afraid to get on the horn. I mean, he was in touch with the FBI um, when the Michigan Legion was plotting. He was working with um, government officials in Michigan to try to thwart that plot. So I think. I think he is not sung enough. Um, so he, he was a remarkable guy. And, and maybe my fellow panelists have some other thoughts on local connections. Or maybe not. Well, <laughs> you know, there's, one, there's one that I would add. Of course, uh, as, as, as Katie has said, I mean, Phil Slomovitz, uh, you know, it was a, a unique person at a unique time uh, Jewish News was created. He created it because, in his belief, absolute belief in the in the correctness and necessity of a Jewish state, and it was a Zionist publication from the get-go. The Chronicle was not. You know, it speaks a little bit maybe to some of when uh, Eli mentioned earlier in the or, or the the um, documentary, the polling, and you know maybe 25 percent of Jews were kind of you know not supportive of uh, you know loosening or maybe we're even in favor of tightening, uh, you know, um, quotas, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, within our community, this was not always a, the Zionistic Israel community that we've come to know it. That's largely because of people like Phil Slomovitz, Emma Shaver comes to mind, uh, others where this was their call, this was their passion, and people like Phil drove it. But there was one other person, and again, Katie, you, you may know certainly better than I do, who I think Mr. Slomovitz was very close with on a number of issues, and that was Senator Vandenberg. Um, I know Senator Vandenberg was very helpful as it related to uh, when, when Mr. Slomovitz started the Jewish News, the Jewish News was having problems with the post office. Um, you can figure for yourself whether the post office was or wasn't interested in maybe mailing a, a, another Jewish newspaper or whatever. But uh, Senator Vandenberg uh, and, and Mr. Slomovitz worked very closely to make sure that the Jewish news could even come out, aside from the people who donated and, and helped support it at the outset. But also, I believe that that was one of the close friends and allies that, uh, that Mr. Slomovitz had here. And that would make, by extension, Senator Vandenberg one of those positive uh, figures, I believe, in our history at that time. Now, to get back to one of your earlier points, I mean, did we really see the Holocaust as this big solidifying, this solidifying moment for the Metro, Metro Detroit Jewish community in terms of its support for a Jewish state, something like Israel? Yeah, that's, that's the moment. That, that's Israel is the glue, as, as um, one member of the community put it. Israel is the glue that, that binds the community together. When, when the Holocaust and the idea of a, of a Jewish nation state are bound together, that's the moment um, when American Jews in Detroit and elsewhere um, really, really began to think about Israel as a, as a place for saving that remnant from Europe. Um, and that's, you know, that's a remarkable pivot for um, American Jews in the 40s. So it's really, 1944 is really that moment um, when, when American Jews begin imagining, this is, this is how we can help. This is how we intervene. We don't have to absorb um, millions of people. Here's where we'll put them. So it's that, that's, the, that's the link between the two. Hmm. Now, I, I wonder, I think one of the, the most difficult topics to kind of broach in, in terms of the Holocaust is that there is this idea th that it's a this singular kind of moment, in, in, incredibly complex, and yet we're supposed to learn from it, and we're supposed to be able to apply it to maybe contemporary situations, but yet there's this, there is a reluctance to explicitly draw that kind of comparison because of the uniqueness of it. So how, how do we how do we advance that conversation? What can we take from, from this series of, uh, of events, and, and how, can, how can we apply to today? This is, I mean, this is for, for anybody to kind of weigh in on. Maybe I can take a shot at it. Um, you know, the Polish Jewish lawyer Rafael Lemkin coined the term genocide in 1944. Um, and he said we needed the term 
precisely because this is something that happens so often. Uh, the problem is that we don't often use the, we don't often call things genocide because we've set the bar so high or so low, I guess, at the Holocaust. And there are other atrocities, there are other things that Raphael Lemkin certainly would have regarded as genocide. That's why he made the term. Um, but don't rise to the level of the Holocaust, perhaps, um, in whatever measures one wants to use. So I think we have to recognize that there are other atrocities that take place and use the knowledge that we've gained from the Holocaust. The Holocaust has been very well studied um, as a result of which we as historians, political scientists, philosophers have acquired a lot of tools from the Holocaust, from studying the Holocaust that we can apply to other atrocities um, and that we can use as early warning signs to try to prevent genocides and atrocities from happening elsewhere around the world based on what we've learned from the Holocaust. Uh, Eli, I just as we sit here in the, in the Zeckelman Holocaust Center, I think that whole question about the, the enormity, the uniqueness of the Holocaust, you know, lessons and how we kind of deal with that. I think in many ways this institution has evolved from when it started with Sharita Plata. It was the remnant of the survivors and it was very much that the Holocaust is, was, is this unique uh, event in history and nothing else can or should be compared to it. And I try to, maybe it was about four years ago, I remember, uh, and, and this was kind of where that, it all came together. There was a rally here, competing rallies on the lawn of the Holocaust Center. There was one group where it had to do with uh, borders and, um, uh, and, and people you know, stuck at the border. And there was one group and they used the Holocaust Memorial Center and the message of the Holocaust as a background for why therefore we ought to be uh, more welcoming because we ourselves know what it was like to have borders closed. Uh, there was another group who was rallying, and it was actually kind of a couple groups. One group uh, was, you know, we, this is a unique institution. The Holocaust was a unique event in history, and it has that kind of Jewish, you know, core, if you will. And then there was another group that had joined in called the Proud Boys. And of course, they saw uh, you know, what this was all about as something, you know, through a very different filter. But I think when we look at this very building we're in, this organization, where it started, what its purpose was, how it's evolved into not just how do you properly uh, commemorate the Holocaust and its uniqueness and distinctness, but also for the educational programming in the, uh, and where this particular institution has gone in that regard. But it was right out here on our front lawn four or five years ago, pre let's say pre-COVID, when you had those groups and then you had another group there who was piggybacking for its own reasons. Hmm. Now, we're, we're just about t at time right now, but I do, I do want to wrap up with, with one last question, and I think it kind of gets to the core of the mission of the kind of documentary series that we're, we're discussing here today. And part of that is that I, I think a lot of us here on, on this panel and in this room have had the privilege of hearing these accounts directly face-to-face -face with, with Holocaust survivors and people that have been directly involved in, in what happened um, so many years ago. But there will, become, there, there will come a generation where those kinds of accounts, those direct accounts and conversations won't be able to happen. And obviously a documentary like this serves to be a, a testament to something, to, to, to those kinds of accounts. But I do wonder that as an audience, besides just watching, a, a film series like this. What, what else can we do to uphold some of the, the, the memories and, and some of these accounts uh, uh, for posterity? Um, Dr. King, we, we can start with you, and then Reverend Adams, maybe we'll, we'll wrap with you. Well, I, I am very interested in um, the Holocaust Center's approach with some of the new docents um, that it's using. 
the, who are outside the Jewish community, who are learning about the Holocaust and learning about um, the history and why why it matters, why it matters to them, even though their um, their ancestors were um, probably not affected by it. And that's a that's a remarkable strategy, I think, that it you know it universalizes it in some ways in in the best sense. Um, I think one of the, the key messages of this documentary is that this is a fight for humanity. So we all should care about it. We all should learn about it and feel invested in it. And I think that's what, um, what this program is trying to do. And I th think that's a remarkable way to approach it. Reverend Adams, do you have any final thoughts on it? Uh, two things. One, the Interfaith Leadership Council is truly dedicated to bringing about unity and um, community. And so we have a, a, a new approach called Bridging to Belonging that we're trying to spread throughout the southeastern region, particularly, where we help people to become um, knowledgeable and uh, relatable to each other, where we can build relationships with people that don't look like us, with people that we have maybe never met before and we learn more about them because when you learn about a person, you may not agree with all of their philosophies, but you can certainly learn to respect that person for who they are. And that's something that you'll probably hear more and more about as we go forward. Because one of the things, interfaith is talking about faith. Faith is what guides most of us. Even people that are um, agnostic or atheists have some form of belief. And so we're the interfaith community that's trying to bring about community and bridging to belonging. In other words, we're all part of humanity so that we can connect. In addition to that, there's also an organization called the Coalition for Black and Jewish Unity. There's one here uh, in the local area, and there's also the one that was started in Washington, D.C. And those came about as a result of trips to Israel and the relationship between the Jewish people and the black community. Because for us, the African-American community, uh, if it had not been for the Jewish community during that time, we would not have been able to buy houses. We would not have been able to provide food for some of our family because Jewish families sold their houses to black folk. And they also hired a lot of our uh, African-American people to work for them in their homes and their businesses. So there's a great deal of uh, gratitude. And uh, Sander Levin, <laughs> truly is a name that rings throughout our community for years and years and years. And it continues to ring out even though uh, the, the, the uh, Levin brothers and family is no longer in, uh, in, in Congress. But there's a tremendous amount of respect when we were talking about positivity or positive people within the community. I couldn't think of anyone and then I remembered from a little kid growing up all I heard was about the Levins. So those are a couple of things that are going on right now uh, with Interfaith and the coalition. And also, I just ask all of you to learn someone else, you know, talk to them and teach your children because that's what's going to make the difference. I think that's a beautiful sent sentiment to end this conversation. Thanks everyone for your time and thank you to our guests. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Wollishan, and I work for the National uh, Education Team at the Anti-Defamation League, and I'm the Associate Director of Anti-Semitism Programs. And I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity to close us out this evening. Um, and I want to extend ADL's and my own personal gratitude to our distinguished panel of educators and community leaders who are working tirelessly to educate about the Holocaust and the dangers of anti-Semitism. This sense of gratitude also extends to all of you who have taken your time on this Wednesday evening for this important event, have even stayed after you thought you were over. <laughs> and finally, I, after viewing the museum this afternoon for the first time and seeing survivors and part of this, I'm extremely grateful that survivors are such an important part of this community 
and I'm excited to be able to join you on a Sunday and you know, have the opportunity to hear your story firsthand and take on responsibility for ensuring that they're passed on to the next generation. So in my work for the ADL, I am an educator on anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. And I know that we've done a tremendous amount of learning this evening, but I would be foolish to pass on the opportunity to deliver some of my own thoughts. Although I just labeled myself an educator, in the rich history of our Jewish people, I prefer the title of storyteller. There are two stories I wanted to share in reflecting, one of which might be known to many here, and another less known. The latter comes to me vis-a-vis -vis a Holocaust educator who heard it directly from the survivor himself. This survivor, then a young boy, fled his home country, a former Soviet satellite, to escape the oncoming Nazi army. He fled so quickly that he could not take any of his personal possessions, but in a moment, he felt compelled to take a set of tefillin. So tefillin, for those that might not be familiar, are boxes containing the Shema, the declaration that in the Jewish commit tradition that we commit to one God. This boy knew nothing of his Jewish tradition, was not observant, but for some reason he felt compelled to take this set of tefillin. The conflict continued, and this boy could now be called a man. At the conclusion, this man was part of the forces that liberated Maidanic. He entered the camp's crematorium and was overwhelmed by the sight. His response? Wrapped to fill in. He knew nothing of the significance or how to pray, but he felt compelled by the commandments of our people that we would bind the words that we accept only one God as a sign on our hand and on our head. This story has always re resonated with me because seemingly re the response to our attempted destruction was not sadness, although I'm sure there was plenty of pain. It was not in that very moment anger. It was community. It was togetherness. It was the feeling that those leather straps created a connection to generations lost and those yet to come. That same responsibility is with us to respond to the most violent forms of anti-Semitism with the strength of our community, both Jewish and allies alike. The second story came to me was that of the Tower of Babel. This story, one that has many retellings across faiths, is about a united human people who speak only one language. These people decide that they would like to build a tower to speak with God. God's response is telling. The line in the Torah reads, and the Lord said, look, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. In working with anti-Semitism, it is clear that anti-Semitism is a fantasy, a projection of ill-informed thoughts and ideas about the Jewish people that, with little basis in reality. This lack of understanding leads to implicit and explicit anti-Semitism that is corrosive to our society. But what if we did all understand each other like we did before? What if we took the time to learn from one another, to work for a world that eradicated this form of hatred, that thrives on misinformation, this world we see today? While God's fear was seemingly human interference with his domain, the impossible that we could accomplish by understanding and embracing our differences and what that could do to build a better world I imagine that every day. While you all here may be receptive to these sentiments, unfortunately we here at the ADL and many of you know that anti-Semitism is again on the rise in the world, the United States, and in Michigan. In 2021, we had 112 incidents of anti-Semitism in 32 cities across the state. We also tracked more than 150 incidents of white supremacy propaganda from locations all over Michigan. Our state data mirrors what we have seen across the country. The 2021 audit reflected an all-time high of anti-Semitic incidents in the US and our own state. This data from these 112 incidents from January 1st through December 31st of 2020 reported to the Michigan office work out to be three incident or an incident every three days, an anti-Semitic incident in the state of Michigan. This is why education programs like this one and other vital programs that the ADL and the Zeckelman Center produce are critical to making a positive change. 
We have a memorandum of understanding with the Zeckelman Holocaust Center to provide our Echoes and Reflections program, a partnership with the Shoah Foundation. And it's a partnership that we value. This year, the Michigan team has approximately 30 schools signed up for No Place for Hate, providing critical anti-bias work to teachers and educators, as well as students. And this Sunday, ADL, along with his partners, will host our annual Walk Against Hate, another community advocacy event that is bringing vital awareness to the issue of anti-Semitism in our community. If you're not already planning on attending Saturday morning, or Sunday morning, I encourage you to show that tonight was the first step in combating hate, and like Rabbi Heschel said, an opportunity to pray with your feet. To close, I want to challenge all of us here to take what we have learned tonight outside of these walls and outside of this community. Speak to a survivor, learn their story, safeguard their memory. I challenge us to be a community that, in the words of our first president, gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate the partnership of the Zeckelman Center in hosting this important conversation and our panelists for their insights and their thoughtful conversation. We also want to thank Eli Newman, our moderator, for guiding this critical dialogue. But most importantly, we appreciate that you took the time to listen, and we hope that you will go home and speak to your friends and reflect. And just a reminder to watch The U.S. and the Holocaust on PBS. It premieres on September 18th, starting at 8 p.m. You can also stream it at pbs.org. Well, PBS Books is also offering another show in dialogue with the U.S. and the Holocaust, and that is featuring author talk, Ibu Patel. We need to build field notes for a diverse democracy. It actually airs on Thursday, September 22nd at 8 p.m. at pbsbooks.org, Facebook, and on our YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm Heather Marie Montilla. Happy reading. <laughs>